We have another about 25 people. Actually, people are showing up fairly on time. So um, yeah. maybe maybe let's 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 start. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll give you a little introduction. So first of all, it's a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mike Zadatel. Mike is a California native. Um, he received actually his first degree from Deep Springs College. Uh, where, among other things, he got his skills in, I think, herding the sheep and uh, and horse riding. Mm -hmm. uh, but then he continued um, at Harvard uh, and finished with highest honors in physics in all mm -hmm. nine. And in due time, he got his PhD at Berkeley and went uh, for a postdoc position at Microsoft Station Q in Santa Barbara. Uh, then in seventeen. He joined uh, Princeton physics faculty. And in 18, he moved to Berkeley, uh, California, uh, as a Thomas and Edison Schneider chair. Uh, Mike has shown independent creativity and strengths already as a student um, uh, and a postdoc. He published important works which uh, fused the ideas of topology. Uh, with powerful numerical methods. And a testament to it is uh, a coveted uh, Macmillan Award uh, bestowed on Mike in 2018, in 18, if I remember right, uh, for his theoretical and computational breakthroughs, uh, including transformative, but more transformative work uh, on the fractional quantum Hall effect. Uh, Mike is equally fluent in analytical and numerical methods of condensed matter theory. And he became now one of the recognized leaders uh, in theory of twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, a part of this theory we will perhaps hear about today. On a more personal note, I met Mike first in Santa Barbara when he was a postdoc. And his ability to, to see immediately the core of the physics we were discussing and separate important issues from secondary ones uh, was striking, striking then and striking now. And uh, later on, I I was listening to Mike's talks, and even over Zoom, uh, they were captivating enough for me to focus on physics and and forget about the grinds and shocks of the life outside our science. And today, this kind of immersion is is, is really what I'm looking for. So, so, so looking forward to your talk, Mike. I'm very intimidated, Leonid. That's a pretty, especially with all the news happening. This is a pretty tall, <laughs> tall order. But thank you for the very kind introduction. It's good to see all of you. A lot of the physics here, as we were discussing before, a lot of it had its origin in Yale back in the 90s and so on. So I'm excited to be able to talk about it in front of all of you. Um, yeah, so the topic of the, this talk is going to be charged skirmions and superconductivity. Um, so let me just give an outline. First, I'd like to give an introduction to skirmions as a whole, the history, where they came from in particle physics and where we've subsequently found them in uh, condensed matter systems. Uh, then I'm going to move into a perhaps somewhat speculative, but I think exciting idea for how skirmions might be relevant uh, as the mechanism for superconductivity in this exciting class of compounds twisted by layer graphene um, that were recently discovered to be superconducting um, at MIT and later elsewhere. And then finally, I want to touch, you know, this is an, a rather exotic mechanism for superconductivity, touch on at least some initial directions for what experiments we might do uh, in order to see if this might really be why superconductivity is happening there. And that's a collaboration with Ali Azdani's group uh, at Princeton. Okay, so let's jump into skirmions. So and the starting point, I think, is the inspiration for a lot of us working in topological physics. Uh, and it sense it goes back to this tension, you might say, between the two ways we like to think about what matter is. Um, one is, of course, particles, billiard balls. Uh, the other is the idea of fields, which in some way I at least find you know, more aesthetically pleasing, that you have a continuous medium, uh, like, say, the ether or a uh, fluid like air. Um, and what Lord Kelvin noticed is there might be a sense in which uh, the continuous picture of having a field might be a more fundamental one and could give rise to objects that are stable like particles in the following way. What he imagined is you could have air, uh, and air could support topological defects and the velocity, which are vortices. Uh, and due to the fact that vorticity uh, had a 
quantized circulation, uh, that quantization of the circulation could lead to the stability of the vortex, and hence maybe they had the stability uh, that we can interpret as particles. Um, so you could then imagine a kind of fanciful version of the periodic table or different uh, you know, molecular compounds might come from the different knots that could be occurring uh, in the vorticity. So <clears throat> in a sense, there's a, a lot of uh, interest in topological physics now is kind of modern, more quantum interpretations of exactly this sort of result. Um, we could think about uh, topological defects in, say, a classical liquid crystal uh, or more exotic manifestations like the fractional excitations of fractional quantum Hall effect um, or spin charge separation in insulators. Um, so these can be uh, interpreted in many cases as some sort of topological defects or vortices in some uh, continuous uh, field of the problem. So that's sort of our inspiration. Um, the particular type of vortex or defect I'm going to be talking about uh, is something called a skirmion. Um, so this was first discussed, as far as I know, um, uh, by Tony Skurry, Skirmy in the context of nuclear physics. So he was trying to des um, describe where um, the neutrons and protons came from. And rather than thinking of them as fundamental particles, he wanted to think of them as these vortices or topological defects in a field. So what was the field in this case? It was the actually um, the meson fields of the, the pions. So those are bosons. So we start out with a bosonic field. And it turns out that field has four components, which are subject to constraint, which puts them on uh, to have unit magnitude. So uh, you can think of the target space of this field is a three-dimensional sphere. So at the field theory level, what we're describing, we're just thinking about then is a, a nonlinear sigma model. So what you then considered is um, what do the possible finite energy field configurations look at? So you want to take one snapshot in time, and you have this order parameter, which is a point on the sphere. Uh, and in particular, if you're thinking about a finite energy field configuration at large um, radii, you want to um, ensure that the field asymptotes to some constants. So you don't have a large elastic energy. And the interesting thing he noticed is if you consider the space of field configurations from a slice of space into the sphere, um, the set of those maps is actually classified by a topological invariant, the, the homotopy group. Um, uh, which was exactly classified by an integer. So that means that there's these distinct field configurations which can't be continuously related to each other. So his idea was maybe those um, uh, different type of field configurations correspond to particles. Okay, so this sounds rather abstract talking about it this way, and it's a little bit hard to visualize uh, when we're talking about the three-dimensional sphere. So let's actually skip down a dimension. So let's imagine instead that space is two-dimensional and the field I'm looking at um, is a two-dimensional sphere. So I only have three components to the vector I'm looking at. Um, fortunately, you still have the same topological statement uh, that the homotopy space of uh, such configurations is the integer, and it's easy to draw pictures of them. So representatives uh, of the non-trivial class are all labeled by an integer I'll call Q, the so-called topological charge. And if you think of this map as being a sphere from space, which I'm going to fold down into a sphere, back into the sphere, then the Q equals one type of um, texture looks like this hedgehog. It's like uh, you know, the, the spin field points out of the plane everywhere. And likewise, there's an anti-version of this where you just invert the orientation uh, of the field, and that gives uh, the charge negative one configuration. So the idea is you, know, you might smoothly deform what these fields look like, um, but the, uh, the basic topological charge can't be changed. Um, one important uh, expression we're going to need a little bit later is that even though this topological charge is a global invariant, there's actually a local way uh, to go about computing it. You, part, you compute this particular uh, n dot n cross n term, you know, computed from the local derivatives. That gives what we call locally the topological density. And then if you integrate that over all space, you're guaranteed uh, to get an integer, which is the topological charge. OK, so the idea then would be that the conservation of the particles you might be interested in would correspond to the fact that uh, this topological invariant is uh, not changed when you have smooth deformations of the field. Um, so Skirmy's idea then was that uh, nucleons were actually skirmions in uh, the pion field, basically the version of this in one higher dimension. Okay, but there's an interesting aspect of this that you know Lord Kelvin didn't have to think about, which is when we have quantum mechanics, you know, when you have a particle, you need to be able to talk about what its quantum statistics are. Is it a boson uh, or a fermion? And you know, if we want to explain nucleons, for instance, we need to be able to get fermions. 
but that's an interesting puzzle. So we started out with a field which was purely bosonic, the pions. Could it be possible that these topological de defects in a bosonic field could actually have the correct quantum statistics of fermions? Um, so there's a kind of beautiful history in high energy physics uh, going to answer this question, uh, showing that the answer is yes. So a sort of toy version of this was first worked out in the context of even one lower dimension, one plus one, where instead of skirmions, you just have uh, domain walls in some uh, bosonic field. And uh, the work of Coleman and others showed that there could be topological terms, which actually gave these domain walls the correct uh, statistics of fermions. As far as I'm aware, the higher dimensional version of this, which showed that the skirmions really were in fact fermions, um, is the work due to Ed Witten. So with these insights that there could be topological um, berry phase sorts effects in the effective action uh, for these bosonic fields uh, that cause these topological defects to in fact be fermions. And with that, you kind of have the final thing you need to really think of this as a consistent um, theory of the nucleons. Okay, but why should high energy physics get to have all the fun? Um, might uh, skirmions be relevant in condensed matter systems? Uh, the answer is certainly yes, and I'll talk about a couple systems where that's the case. One of the most obvious ones, which you know is almost classical in nature, is I'm going to let the order parameter that I'm getting skirmions in to just be the ferromagnetic order parameter uh, of some sort of magnet. So the scenario you might look at is you might have a two-dimensional thin film, um, which is a ferromagnet, and so at each point in space you can assign a vector corresponding to the direction of the magnetization, um, which will have unit magnitude. And then you can look at defects in this order parameter, uh, which are skirmions. So there's a bunch of cool physics here in some systems. Uh, it turns out that there's a term in the Hamiltonian, the so-called DM interaction, which actually pre prefers um, the magnetization to process in a certain way, which actually corresponds to there being a lattice of skirmions. So you can see a texture like this on the left here. The color is indicating the magnetization in the XY plane. Uh, and the overall uh, brightness from black to white is uh, indicating how it cants in the north and south directions. And you can see here, there's a lattice uh, where there's a set of locations where the polarization points to the North Pole, and then it cants down to the XY plane um, and winds around. Each of those is basically a squashed version of a skirmion. Um, so this is a cool example of that. There's other systems where, you know, generally the ground state doesn't have any skirmions, but the skirmions can just get introduced as defects. So on the right here, I'm showing a picture of such a system. Um, you know, they're some they're metastable configurations, and by driving currents through it, and something you can uh, force there to be skirmions, and these skirmions just look like uh, particles which you can manip manipulate with currents and so on. Okay, but in this context, um, <clears throat> the magnetic fields are basically classical, and the resulting particles are very large objects, you know, maybe several 200 nanometers or so across. Um, so you don't really think about them as like quantum coherent, you know, particles that could be in a superposition of different positions and so on. And in particular, the statistics aren't particularly interesting or, or relevant. Um, so it's interesting to try and go beyond this kind of classical version of skirmions uh, back to skirmies vision and ask, is there some more quantum system uh, where we might have skirmions um, such that, for example, the electron, which we usually think of as a fundamental particle, might be understood um, as a skirmion in some order parameter. Okay, So that's the physics I want to now uh, review, and it goes back to imp important work that happened in Yale uh, in the 90s. So the answer to this question is yes. And the setting for it is the quantum Hall effect. So the two-dimensional film I'm going to think about is a clean semiconductor like gallium arsenide in a strong magnetic field. Um, and the electron motion gets quantized into these so-called cyclotron orbits and observed that when the electron density is at certain uh, commensurate uh, ratios compared to the magnetic field, you get these insulating states uh, which are the integer quantum Hall effects, which have an integer uh, Hall conductance in units of E squared over H. Okay, so where does magnetism show up here? Well, the interesting thing you'll note uh, looking at these uh, Hall plateaus here is that as you change the magnetic field, you get a set of integer quantum Hall effects, which at low magnetic fields always have integer, uh, sorry, even integer coefficients. So you see uh, a Hall coefficient of 10, 8, 6, 
But then interestingly, when you go to the strongest magnetic fields, instead of having even, uh, even integer coefficients, you start seeing all odd integers, five, four, three, two, one. So what's the picture for this and what does it have to do with magnetism? Uh, well, let's just consider what the single particle spectrum uh, of electrons looks like in a strong magnetic field. So you get this famous um, um, effect of Landau quantization the uh, eigen energies of electron become quantized into perfectly flat lambda levels uh, indexed by this integer n. So you have the zeroth lambda level, first lambda level, second lambda level. Uh, and the energy gap between them is the so-called cyclotron energy that scales with the magnetic field. But electrons carry spin. Um, so each of these lambda levels really has two flavors, one for the spin up electrons and one for the spin down electrons. And if you just examine the energy scales in a material like gallium arsenide, you'll find that the splitting uh, between different cyclotron orbits is much, much larger than the splitting to the, between the two spin species coming from the Zeeman energy uh, by a factor of 10 or 20 or so. Okay, so how does this relate to the odd versus even integer thing? So the explanation of the Hall plateaus is you get uh, an integer quantum Hall effect whenever your Fermi level is such that it fills an integer number of Landau levels. Now, if there was no Zeeman splitting, the up and the down levels would always be degenerate. And so as you change the chemical potential, you would always fill an up and down together. And so the Hall conductance would jump by two and then four and then six. And that's indeed what's seen at the weaker magnetic fields. Um, you're only gonna see the odd integer quantum Hall effect when the uh, Fermi level, at least naively, lies between um, the two spin split uh, levels. And that would correspond to, to uh, filling an odd number of them. But the interesting thing is, if you only look at this at the single particle level, you'd then expect that the gap when you're at an odd integer filling is set by the Zeeman energy, which splits these two levels. But that's tiny. That's only like a, a fraction of a Kelvin at a couple, uh, couple Tesla. What's seen in the experiment uh, is that the energy scale uh, for the odd integer gaps is many orders of magnitude, or at least an order of magnitude larger than that. Uh, in fact, what you'd find is that the gap for the integer quantum odd integer quantum Hall effect has a scale which is comparable to the typical Coulomb repulsion between any two electrons. So what that suggests is um, the, the physics which is driving these odd integer fillings is not the Zeeman energy, but actually interaction effect. And what's happening is we should actually interpret it as uh, essentially spontaneous symmetry breaking, where even in the complete absence of a Zeeman field, uh, the electrons would just spontaneously polarize into either the up uh, or the down uh, uh, spin species when you're at odd integer filling. Okay, so that's just to say that the basic uh, cartoon we should have for uh, the integer quantum Hall effect at odd integer filling uh, is what's called a quantum Hall ferromagnet. So due to interaction effects, essentially the exchange interaction, electrons prefer to all polarize in the same direction. So the Coulomb interaction is what drives this ferromagnetic symmetry breaking. And then the Zeeman field just very weakly pins whether the spins want to align or anti-align uh, with the Zeeman energy. Okay, so once we know that we have this integer, you know, this ferromagnetic integer quantum Hall effect, and that the pinning due to the Zeeman field that picks the direction is extremely weak, we can then go and think about there being defects in the order parameter of this integer quantum Hall ferromagnet. Uh, and here's where the really interesting physics comes into play, uh, coming from the topology uh, of the Landau levels. So it was worked out by Sondi and others uh, in the early 90s, uh, was that there's certain Berry effects coming from the Landau level, which tell you that the topological charge of uh, defects in the order parameter, in other words, whether there's a skirmion there, actually carries physical electrical charge. So what this boxed equation means is you have your order parameter, you can locally look at the way it's deforming and from that compute the topological charge density. And then you'll find that rho, the physical charge density is directly proportional to the topological charge density. Uh, and the constant of proportionality is exactly uh, the Hall conductance in units of H over E squared. Uh, this is the so-called churn number C. So depending on the sign of the magnetic level, uh, uh, the magnetic field, the Hall conductance will either be positive or negative and that will switch uh, the relation between the skirmion density uh, and the physical electron density. Okay, so the basic take-home mechanism uh, takeaway here is that skirmions in the order parameter of an integer quantum Hall ferromagnet actually carry electrical charge. 
So I can give a, a little bit of a cartoon for where this effect comes from. Um, let's imagine that you have a skirmion uh, in the order parameter of the- Hey, quantum. Mike. Hey, yeah. Mike, it might, it might be helpful if at this point you explain that in, in natural units, the charge of one skirmion is one electron. Uh, yeah, so if we take this uh, formula I have here, so this is just the local version of it, like Nick's saying, you should now integrate this over all space and ask what's the total charge. Uh, and what you'll find is the four pi is chosen here such that for every one skirmion, that's the charge you get when you integrate the thing, you'll find that the electrical charge is C, the churn number, which is plus or minus one. Uh, so each skirmion is exactly uh, one total electron charge. So that's the global version of this statement here. Okay, so skirmions enter, uh, you know, when you introduce an uh, electrical charge here, they actually enter in the form of skirmions. So why, where does this come from? Like if you looked at those more conventional magnetic systems, like an iron or something I was talking about, you wouldn't have this relation. Uh, what does it have to do with the quantum Hall effect? Uh, well, the, the simple argument you can make is the following. Suppose you imagine that the spin polarization of this ferromagnet is just frozen in the form of a skirmion shown here. And then let's introduce one additional test electron. And I'm gonna have it move around in the background of this ferromagnet. So because of the ferromagnetic exchange interaction, as this electron moves around, its spin wants to cant to follow the texture of the local magnetization. But now we have an interesting quantum mechanical effect. We know if you have a spin, which is moving around its orientation, it actually picks up a Berry phase in proportion to the area traced out on the block sphere. So that means that as the electron moves through this potential, it's picking up an additional Berry phase uh, in proportion to the way uh, its spin is winding around. Uh, and if you work out what the expression for that Berry phase accumulated is, it's exactly locally equal to uh, the skirmion density n dot n cross n. Okay, so as far as the electrons are concerned, as they move around, they pick up this extra Berry phase. And the electrons don't really know whether that Berry phase is coming from an external magnetic field or whether it's coming from this contribution to its spin processing around. Um, either way, uh, because of the Hall effect, uh, the Hall effect tells you that the electron density is proportional to any deviation in the applied magnetic field. Um, and because it doesn't know how to distinguish between the applied magnetic field and this Berry phase contribution, it tells you that the electrical charge um, becomes proportional to the Berry phase induced by the spin motion. Um, and this is exactly um, uh, what gives rise to the fact that the electrical charge density becomes uh, proportional to the skirmion density. So that's where this physics comes from, and it's why the Hall effect is so important for, for getting it. Okay, so the physical takeaway is this is the only system that I'm aware of where we know that topological defects in an order parameter, okay, I guess putting, putting aside pions and, and Skirmi's model of the nucleon, but at least in the condensed matter setting, it's the only model I know of where topological defects in an order parameter, Skirmion, actually carry um, uh, electrical charge. So this is our basic formula here. Electrical charge is the churn number, i.e. Uh, the Hall conductance times the number of Skirmions in the system. And this has you know, real experiments that were seen by uh, Sean, really amazing back in the 90s. Um, this effect was um, shown in NMR. So the way the experiment works is they start in the integer quantum Hall effect, uh, and they can use NMR to measure what the spin polarization is. And you see when the electron density is right at say filling one odd integer filling, they find the maximal possible spin polarization corresponding to this integer quantum Hall ferromagnet. And then what they do is they deviate the density in the system in order to introduce electrical charges. And if this uh, skirmion hypothesis is correct, every time an electron enters the system or a charge enters the system, it actually comes in the form of one of these skirmions. And if you look at the structure of a skirmion, it's a rather large object, which contains at its core a region where all the spins have been flipped from the dominant up to down. So that means each skirmion actually carries a large core of reverse magnetization and therefore it's gonna have a large magnetic moment. So what you then predict is for every charge added, rather than flipping one spin as if they had spin one half, it's gonna actually flip many multiples of a Bohr magneton. Uh, and that's what's seen. So they plot how the spin polarization varies as you add electrons to the system. You get this very steep slope indicating that it depolarizes uh, rapidly and it corresponds to an effective G factor uh, which is much larger than two, 
um, because these objects carry a large magnetic moment uh, in comparison to the electron. So this is uh, one of the first experimental evidences um, for why these skirmions were really relevant to the integer quantum Hall effect. Okay, so <clears throat> now I wanna move on to a new possible application of this idea of uh, skirmions uh, coming not from the integer quantum Hall effect, but actually from twisted bilayer graphene. And the way I'm gonna structure this is, first, I'm gonna consider an abstract model. I don't wanna get into the details of twisted graphene yet. I'm just gonna as assume that I have some model that supports skirmions. And I want to um, describe a setup to you where the existence of these skirmions would actually be extremely favorable for producing um, uh, unconventional superconductivity. Okay, so this is work I should say that was done in collaboration uh, with my folks stocks here at Berkeley as well as Ashwin Vishwanath's group at Harvard. Okay, so the basic question I want to ask is, you know, in the conventional BCS theory of superconductivity, there's certain limits um, on TC uh, coming from the strength, say, of the phonon interactions. But what if the objects which are pairing together to give rise to a superconductivity uh, are actually these skirmions, topological defects? Uh, could that change the basic uh, constraints on what the scales for superconductivity might be? Uh, and I want to show you that the answer is yes. Okay, so if we're talking about superconductivity, what are the basic ingredients we need? Well, superconductivity, uh, there's kind of two components, uh, okay, at least in somewhat cartoon picture. So the first thing you need is you need some mechanism which causes electrons, uh, which are fermions, to bind together into a charge two boson, uh, which we call Cooper pairs. So this is the so-called pairing glue. Um, conventionally, it's the exchange of phonons, but pe people have, you know, uh, propose more, more exotic mechanisms, and I'm certainly going to propose a rather exotic mechanism here. Okay, so the first thing is the pairing glue. Uh, once you have these bosons, the second thing you need is that these bosons need to bose condense and uh, develop phase coherence. So when you have those two together, that leads to uh, superconductivity. Um, so the question I want to ask is, could it be that the objects which pair together are chargy skirmions, uh, and if so, could it be favorable for those um, paired skirmions to actually uh, form a superfluid? So we're going to uh, discuss these in turn. First, why would the skirmions want to pair together in the fir first place? And second, why would they condense? <clears throat> now, if I go back to the integer quantum Hall effect, where we know we get these skirmions, we're going to find there's certainly going to be an obstacle to superconductivity. Um, you know, to get superconductivity, as I said, you need to develop phase coherence. Uh, and one way to think about phase coherence is you have this boson, you need it to bose condense. And the reason a boson would want to bose condense is because it has a lowest energy state at momenta k is equal to zero. And so it becomes favorable at low enough temperature not to put all the bosons into the ground state. But when you're in a magnetic field, as in the integer quantum Hall effect, the kinetic energy becomes quenched. Rather than having p squared over 2m, you just have these complete flat Landau levels for any object which carries electrical charge. Um, and if you have a completely flat band dispersion, it's very hard to see how you could get a Bose condensation because there's no you know, unique ground state to it. Okay, so having a finite magnetic field, it, it's, it's clearly very hard to get Bose condensation. So how do we get around this while still having skirmions? Okay, so the toy model I'm gonna propose without saying how you would do it in the lab uh, is the following. Well, later I'll say how you do it in the lab. It's twisted by layer graphene, um, but here's the toy model. So what I imagine is I'm gonna actually have two two-dimensional electron gases, which see an opposite magnetic field. So one out of the plane, one into the plane. Um, and to start, I don't imagine there's any tunneling between them. I just have uh, two copies uh, of the quantum Hall problem. Okay, so at the single uh, particle level, I can still look at what the energy spectrum would be, and you'd basically get two copies of Landau levels, one coming from uh, the layer with a positive magnetic field, and the other layer with a negative magnetic field. And, and just like integer quantum Hall effect, I want to imagine that both of these layers are themselves spin full with up and a down pseudo spin. Okay, so that's the setting. Um, and what I want to do is, rather than going to odd integer filling, I'm going to imagine that the Fermi level lies uh, at two, so that I'm filling two of the Landau levels. And you can see that's going to lead to um, um, some interesting competition. 
uh, because the cyclotron gaps, because I have these two copies, actually occur when you fill zero or four or eight lambda levels. Okay, so if I set it filling two and consider these two layers in isolation, both of them individually want to form an integer quantum Hall ferromagnet. So I would prefer to just fully polarize the spin on one and fully polarize the spin on the other. Okay, so to resolve some of the symmetry breaking here, I want to add one more component uh, to the Hamiltonian, which is I'm going to assume that there's a little bit of an anti-ferromagnetic interaction in the spin orientation between the two layers. Um, so that's that term uh, written here. If I have an order parameter n plus for the top layer and an order parameter n minus for the bottom layer, I'm going to couple them with a Heisenberg-like coupling j uh, n plus dot n minus, which prefers that the orientation of this quantum Hall ferromagnetism is always uh, anti-ferromagnetically aligned between the two layers. Now, where might this come from? It's actually quite natural to get anti-ferromagnetism in condensed matter systems. Whenever you have two systems which are very weakly coupled, um, through some tunneling matrix element T, there's this so-called super exchange process where an electron uh, virtually tunnels from one uh, and then comes back. And that tends to lead to actually an anti-ferromagnetic interaction between the two layers. Um, so the way you would generate this is just by introducing a small amount of tunneling between the two layers. Okay, so let's say I have this ingredients. Uh, why might it be good for superconductivity? Okay, well, first let's just analyze the problem of uh, a single skirmion. So I imagine I add one electron to the system. Um, because of the basic physics of integer quantum Hall ferromagnetism, uh, we might suppose it want to, wants to enter in the form of a skirmion in either the top or the bottom layer. Okay? So that's the sort of configuration I've shown here. Uh, but we see an interesting effect now. So because of this anti-ferromagnetic coupling, the spin polarization in the top and the bottom layer want to anti-align. Um, in most of the sample, they're able to do that. But a skirmion involves flipping the orientation of the spins at, at its core. So what that means is that everywhere in the core of this skirmion, you're going to violate uh, the preference to have anti-ferromagnetic alignment between the two layers. And that's going to drastically actually increase the energy of the single skirmion and make it a less favorable excitation. Um, so in particular, it's going to shrink the skirmion into a small, rather high energy object. OK, so a single skirmion pays an energy cost uh, due to this anti-ferromagnetic interaction. OK, but what if I put two skirmions in? In particular, suppose I put two electron charges in. Well, the interesting thing is, as we said, the electrical charge is the skirmion number times the Hall conductance. And my basic setup here was that I had that the top and the bottom layer actually had opposite Hall conductance because they saw opposite magnetic fields. So if I want to put an, uh, electrical, a positive electrical charge in the top layer, the way you would do it is by introducing a skirmion. But if you want to put an electrical charge in the bottom layer, the way you do it is by introducing an anti-skirmion. So the basic uh, field configuration, which corresponds to putting two electrical charges into the system, is a skirmion and an anti-skirmion. And if you ask, how are the field configurations for skirmion and anti-skirmions related? They're exactly equal and opposite. Um, so putting a configuration like that in maintains the constraint that the top field is exactly opposite to the bottom field, and therefore the anti-ferromagnetic coupling between them is perfectly happy with this. So what this means is that a single skirmion, a single charge E, um, has bad anti-ferromagnetic energy, but if you put two charge E's into the system, the anti-ferromagnetism is happy. And that's going to be the basic energetic effect, which is going to give rise to the pairing which bounds these two electrons, or at least two electrical charges, uh, into a charge two Cooper pair. Okay, but you know that's a cartoon. I've said why you might want to have two of them sitting on top of each other, but there's another super important effect, which is these are electrical charges, um, so they experience Coulomb repulsion. And any real theory of superconductivity needs to actually think about that competition between you know, Coulomb repulsion and whatever the mechanism that provides attraction. Um, so here's where the skirmions end up uh, providing a really interesting way for the attractive part to over, always overcome Coulomb repulsion, uh, even uh, without accounting for screening or retardation uh, or the other effects which are uh, usually uh, appealed to in conventional BCS theory. So here's the basic uh, cartoon for the energetics. Um, if you have a skirmion, it's able to have different sizes 
by, by just changing the oversaw scale of the skirmion. So let, let's call the typical size of the skirmion R. Um, and an interesting feature in 2D is you find that the energy of a, the elastic energy of a skirmion coming from the penalty of the field moving is actually scale invariant. So it doesn't really care whether the skirmions are small or large. Um, but when you though, go to then consider the Coulomb repulsion, if you make two skirmions which have a scale of R, the Coulomb repulsion kind of gets smoothed out over that scale. And so you're going to find that the repulsion between these two skirmions goes as one over R, where R is the size. Okay, so by making big skirmions, you're able to just continuously lower um, uh, the Coulomb repulsion between those two objects. On the other hand, we said that there's this ferromagnetic attraction, um, uh, which wants to make sure that the skirmions sit on top of each other to, uh, to maintain the anti-ferromagnetic alignment. And that attraction actually does not go down with the size of the skirmions, it goes up. So you can see the repulsion is going as one over R, where the attraction um, does not go down with distance, it goes up. Uh, and therefore, as long as you make the skirmions large enough, you're guaranteed that there's some scale where the attraction will win out over the repulsion uh, and cause these things to bind. But okay. you assume that there is no uh, deformation of the shape of the skirmion or something, right? So this R squared, I would say, probably is vulnerable to deforming the skirmion field so that you form a string rather than yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. So that's exactly, this is a kind of naive picture, maybe like in first order perturbation theory okay. today, but you're right, really, you need to self consistently um, solve for how what it wants to do. And these are exactly the calculations I show that Shubayu did. You can just ask what's the minimal in, uh, energy configuration of these fields, uh, holding fixed that there needs to be skirmion and one and the other, and ask what's the, the energy to drag them apart. So there's, um, there's the confinement of what the yeah, you do find, I'll, I'll show the numerical result of this. You find that for any positive J, um, as small as you want, um, there's always confinement. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, even, even with completely unscreened one over our Coulomb repulsion. Okay, so, but before doing a less hand wavy uh, version. Question, uh, to, but yeah. what limits their growth? If it's uh, is like the energy gets more and more negative with R. Um, yeah. Uh, well, okay. So the uh, I've slightly so let me think about this. Um, yeah, when you write it out correctly, um, the this is a somewhat naive calculate. What happens is you drag them apart if they're not sitting on top of each other they shrink because um becomes because it becomes unfavorable for for to have the skirmions um so what find when when you calculate when you work it all out you find that the um the pairing energy actually saturates at j when you work out like what the optimal r is mm -hmm. uh, yeah so the, the 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 net takeaway ends up when, when you actually just minimize the field configuration is that the binding energy ends up being J um, um, for any, yeah. So it's a little bit unclear at that kind of hand waving level where I, uh, that I've discussed that. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. I'll look into the paper, thanks. Um, so that was the first ingredient we needed. We needed a mechanism for some pairing attraction to overcome Coulomb repulsion. Um, but the next thing we needed, if we were going to get uh, a Bose-Einstein condensate, is that these objects need to effectively have a dispersion relation like p squared over 2m so that they'll want a Bose condense uh, in the energy minima. So that's a kind of interesting question. We started out with basically two copies of the integer quantum Hall effect, where the kinetic energy was completely quenched. How can it be that when you bind these two skirmions together, you'd end up with something uh, that disperses? So this is actually uh, physics that should be uh, familiar to, to Nick and others. It turns out that there's a purely interacting mechanism uh, for generating a dispersion relation for this bound state of two skirmions. And the basic idea is follows. So <clears throat> suppose I have this pair of two, a skirmion and an anti-skirmion, and I boost it to velocity V uh, being shown here. So, you know, you have these two charges and they're moving in a magnetic field, so they are going to experience a Lorentz force. But because the two layers 
see an opposite magnetic field, as you boost them to velocity v, uh, one of the skirmions is going to get dragged to say the left and the other to the right. Okay, so because of that equal and opposite Lorentz force, as you boost, the two particles get dragged apart. But we said that there's a binding energy from the antiferromagnetism that prefers them uh, to be together. So what that means is that as you boost, you're effectively ripping apart uh, the two skirmions that costs a binding energy and therefore the energy of this object uh, goes up as a function of the velocity you're at. And where you work, when you work it out, you find that the, the loss of binding energy takes exactly the form of quadratic uh, dispersion where the effect of mass is related uh, to the scale of the antiferromagnetic coupling. It's actually very similar to the way, for instance, in uh, Nick Reed's uh, theory of composite fermions in the, frac in the fractional quantum Hall effect um, for how in a flat Landau level, these composite fermions end up having a, a finite mass. Okay, so the takeaway from this is due to this, um, the magnetic fields that they see, uh, you can have interactions generate an effective dispersion relation uh, in a system that at the start has completely uh, quenched kinetic energy. Okay, so um, at, the, at that level, we now have the two ingredients we need. We have a pairing glue, which turns out to be at the scale of the anti-ferromagnetic anti anti interaction J. And we also have an effective mass. And then if we just assume that these are bosons and just do a kind of mean field treatment of the Bose-Einstein condensation, uh, you'll predict a critical temperature that goes as the density of the skirmions um, divided by the effective mass. And if you convert that um, to the electron density, this goes basically as the coupling J um, times um, the doping away from this new equals two quantum Hall effect. Okay, so that's one of the basic uh, statements here that you'll get a, uh, a superconducting temperature um, at a scale set by the interaction J and um, that increases with the density. Okay, I think I'll go through this uh, somewhat quickly. Um, you know, this story seems very hand wavy. Um, is it actually what one finds if you do some exact numerical treatment uh, of a interacting uh, model of this problem? Um, so we, the answer is actually yes. So, you know, ju just like there's a long history in quantum Hall physics of being able to use numerical approaches like exact diagonalization uh, to study the ground state of an integer or a fractional quantum Hall effect, we can do something similar here. The only twist is that you have two copies of the quantum Hall problem which see an opposite magnetic field. Uh, but nevertheless, we can uh, adapt the numerical methods we've developed for the quantum Hall effect for this problem here. Uh, in my group, we used uh, the density matrix for normalization group. And we exactly take the problem I've described. You can take two copies. You have them interacting with a long range Coulomb repulsion and you couple the copies um, with this antiferromagnetic interaction. And we can compute phase diagrams as a strength of J, for instance, and we find clear evidence uh, in the ground state of this model that you have superconductivity. Um, so in our case, it's actually being done on a cylinder. So you have some algebraic um, decay of the superconducting correlations, which we can uh, see very clearly. Um, so I think I won't go into this uh, in any more detail, but uh, just to say that there's very strong numerical evidence that this mechanism, that the energetics really uh, work out and it's real. Okay, so the final part of the talk, I wanted to um, you know, discuss how we might see this in a real experiment. Uh, and in fact, you know, our, our motivation for thinking about this uh, came from twisted bilayer graphene. So how is it related to twisted bilayer graphene? Okay, well, the basic ingredients we need is like two copies of a two-dimensional electron gas, which see equal and opposite magnetic field. I have no idea how you do that with uh, you know, actual <laughs> physical magnetic fields. Uh, but luckily, um, due to the work of Duncan Haldane and others, we know that there can actually just be interesting band structure effects, essentially um, you know, tight binding models that as electrons hop around through the lattice, they acquire certain Berry phases that simulate the physics of magnetic fields without actually needing uh, a physical magnetic field. So that's the sort of um, <clears throat> uh, effect we're going to go for. And it turns out that magic angle graphene, when you inspect the band structure, has exactly the ingredients we need. So this is going to be kind of lightning uh, introduction to magic angle graphene. The physical system we look at is you take a layer of graphene, this famous honeycomb model, and then you stack another layer of graphene on top of it, but with a small twist 
um, in the rotation angle. So when you make a small twist, uh, as you can see in this picture here, you end up with a long wavelength beating pattern where in some regions, the crystal, uh, the, the carbon atoms overlap and in some regions, the anti overlap. And as electrons move through this so-called Moray potential, uh, they see the either overlapping or non-overlapping regions as effectively something like a periodic potential, uh, which gives rise to an entirely new band structure um, where the lattice constant is now a factor uh, many times larger than the original one of the carbon atoms. So the band structure of this model is actually extremely interesting. Uh, what was figured out by um, um, Paco Ganea and later uh, Alan McDonald and others was that when the relative twist angle between the two sheets of graphene is close to the so-called magic angle of one degree, when you plot the dispersion relation, so the energy of an electron relative to its momentum, what you find is there's two extremely flat bands separated from a gap uh, by the rest of the spectrum. Okay, so these two flat bands is what you should now think of is what will play the role of our uh, two layers that we needed for our two copies of the quantum Hall effect. Now, the kind of miracle that was worked out um, by Adrian Poe and others is that if you calculate um, the, uh, the berry phases accumulated as electrons move in these two flat bands, you'll find that it's exactly identical to two copies of the integer quantum Hall effect, uh, but an opposite magnetic field. Um, so the takeaway is that we now believe actually that the microscopic model of twisted bilayer graphene uh, is essentially the model I discussed of um, two integer um, uh, two Landau level like problems in opposite magnetic field uh, coupled with this anti ferromagnetic interaction. Um, so what is then seen in experiment? Well, the, in these famous results of um, uh, MIT, they tune the density in the system, and in the quantum Hall analogy, you can think of that as just changing the Fermi level, uh, moving between different possible occupations of these effective Landau levels. Uh, in the band structure. And what they find is that when you're at certain fillings, which correspond to integer fillings of these pseudo lambda levels, they find uh, insulating states, which are the analogs of the integer quantum Hall effect. So these are what they called the uh, correlated insulators or the Mott insulators. Uh, and most interesting, what they found is what the density deviates a little bit away from filling two of these pseudo lambda levels, uh, they actually discovered superconducting domes. So this is very similar to the scenario that I just discussed, where you're going to start from integer filling of these lambda levels, and when you dope it a little bit, uh, you get superconductivity. Um, so at a high level, that's basically um, our, our idea, um, at least one proposal for how superconductivity might be arising in twisted bilayer graphene uh, because of this band structure effect. Uh, when you look at these mod insulators, they support, uh, at least at a theoretical level, they should support these skirmions. Uh, and then the superconductivity could exactly be a BC, BEC of these paired um, skirmions. So we've been able to do microscopic calculations to figure out what the effective J is, um, this anti-ferromagnetic coupling constant. Uh, and it turns out that at least within this simple model, you end up with a scale for superconductivity, which is about 10 Kelvin uh, times the doping. And that's not so bad. You can see that the scale of the superconductivity is somewhere between a half and two Kelvin. So that's about right. Um, let me show you one picture of the actual skirmion. So this is not a calculation from my group. It's actually the uh, Sid Parmesaron's group at Oxford. Uh, they've done interesting analytic calculations where they exactly consider the problem numerically of starting out uh, in one of these uh, insulating states and adding an electron. Uh, and then they can measure what the resulting charge density looks like and what the pseudospin um, polarization looks like. And they actually see that when electrons enter into this problem, they enter into the form of these skirmions. <clears throat> okay, so this is our somewhat speculative proposal. See right now by Zoom. So this is our proposal. <laughs> seminar by Zoom. Um, I will leave at five. <clears throat> Sorry, this is our proposal. Yes, Leonid. I'll I'll want me to, to, to shut down uh, the fender, but I'm not sure I'll be able to. So just continue, please. Yeah. Leonid. Um, so this is our proposal for um, uh, superconductivity. Um, there's interesting experimental evidence, actually, that I know people in Leonid's group that are thinking about, for instance, 
which does find strong evidence for the superconductivity uh, being of a strongly correlated type. Um, but so far, there's no certainly no direct evidence that it might be coming from skirmions. So in the final couple of minutes, I want to talk about um, some future experiments people might do uh, to try and actually see an experiment that uh, charge enters in twisted bilayer graphene in the form of skirmions um, and that those could lead to the superconductivity. OK, so the final thing I want to ask is, is there a way we could see skirmions in graphene or twisted bilayer graphene? And the proposal we have is that, in fact, scanning tunneling microscopy, uh, which is a way to inject electrons uh, at the nanoscale, uh, might provide a way to actually image skirmions in uh, both the quantum Hall effect and twisted bilayer graphene. So how does this work? Well, the key thing uh, is that the skirmions, which are relevant to twisted bilayer graphene, the order parameter at play is not actually the physical electron spin. Um, that, that would be very difficult to see. Instead, it turns out that the relevant order parameter is actually a combination of uh, the sublattice that electrons are in, whether they're in an A or a B sublattice, uh, and which of the two valleys of graphene they're in, either the K or the K prime valley. So you can see that the, 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 the degrees of freedom here actually have to do with the lattice scale momentum and polarization onto the two sublattices. Uh, so because that's what the actual order parameter is related to, there's some hope that you could see it in STM because STM is able to just individually inject electrons into the, I, either the A or the B sublattice. Okay, so uh, in this basic mapping between twisted bilayer graphene and these order parameters, what you find is that the order parameter in the top layer, N plus, is, uh, corresponds to electrons either being injected in the A sublattice in valley K or the B sublattice in K prime. And the other layer, it's the opposite. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> could we use STM to actually detect uh, skirmions if the order parameter has to do with this sublattice and valley space? Um, so I want to show you that the answer is yes. These are some recently published experiments from Ali Yazdani's group uh, in a somewhat similar, simpler setting than twisted bilayer graphene. Um, it's actually um, integer quantum Hall ferromagnetism and monolayer graphene. OK, so what's the setup here? Um, we're going to have uh, monolayer graphene in a large magnetic field um, so that it produces lambda levels. And then they're going to do STM spectroscopy into the lambda levels of monolayer graphene. Um, so what does the lambda level problem of graphene look like? Um, <clears throat> uh, the interesting thing is in graphene, uh, we have a so-called pseudo-spin degeneracy coming from the fact that electrons have both a spin label as well as a valley label, K and K prime. And what that means is when you go to compute the integer quantum Hall effect, uh, or just the, the lambda level spectrum of <clears throat> electrons in graphene, each lambda level is fourfold degenerate coming from the combination of spin uh, and valley. So this is called the so-called isospin degeneracy. Um, and just like spin and gallium arsenide, what finds is that all four copies of the lambda level are very close in energy uh, and are essentially related by a SU4 uh, symmetry. So at the level of free fermions, you would then expect that you'd only see integer quantum Hall effects when electrons come in at multiples uh, of four lambda levels. Whereas what's seen in practice is you actually see um, some sort of symmetry breaking in the isospin space uh, that leads to integer quantum Hall effects at all the integers. Okay, so the idea then is that in graphene, the integer quantum Hall effect is a form of uh, ferromagnetism in this four-dimensional isospin uh, ferromagnetism space. Uh, and because you have four isospins, there's uh, a lot of interesting uh, order parameters that might occur. So if we're filling two of four lambda levels, for instance, you could form a state where you uh, spin polarize it. So you fill both of the lambda levels for spin up in both valleys, or you could do something where you valley polarize it, or you can do more interesting things. You could fill a lambda level where you coherently go into to a superposition of the two valleys. Uh, and we call that intervalley coherence. Um, it's going to turn out that intervalley coherence is actually the one uh, which is realized in experiments. Okay, so now I want to explain why uh, the STM experiments are actually able to measure um, uh, integer quantum Hall ferromagnetism in the form of this valley order. So the order parameter we're going to be talking about is I can assign um, you know, two spinners corresponding to the spin degree of freedom and the valley degree of freedom, I'll call them uh, sigma and tau. 
And valley order just means that you develop an expectation valley somewhere in the valley uh, pseudo spin space. So if something is valley polarized, that will correspond to a polarization at the North Pole in the valley space. Or if it's intervalley coherent, that corresponds to being in a 50 50 superposition of the North and South Pole. So the physically important part of this intervalley coherence is because it involves a coherent superposition of electrons going into the K and the K prime valley, and the K and the K prime valley differ in momentum, the physical manifestation of that should actually be a charge density wave uh, at a wave vector of K minus K prime. Okay, so the takeaway here is that if you have intervalley coherence as the form of your uh, integer quantum Hall ferromagnetism, that will lead to a charge density wave which triples the unit cell. So uh, we can do calculations of this. Um, uh, the images here just indicate what is the predicted charge density of a quantum Hall ferromagnet uh, when, the, um, when the, the order parameter for the ferromagnet points on different points in the block sphere. And what you find is that indeed when you're on the equator, you get these so-called Kekulé patterns, which are the charge density waves which triple the unit cell. Uh, and because when you're on the equator, you can point on any particular angle, what you find is that as that angle moves around, the particular uh, pattern of the, um, uh, the charge density waves uh, rotates around as that uh, movie shows right here. Okay, so the takeaway is if somehow we could just measure the charge density wave, you'd be able to actually measure where you are on this block sphere. <clears throat> so this is what uh, Ali's group has just recently been able to do in experiments. Um, they use the STM to effectively measure at the atomic scale of the graphene. So these honeycombs here is the actual graphene lattice. Uh, what is the density of electrons? And they find when they sit in this integer quantum Hall effect that you see that the density forms this calculate pattern. So that means they're actually using STM to image the order parameter of this quantum Hall ferromagnet. Okay, so the final question then is, can they see skirmions? Uh, and the answer we believe is yes. So the way they do this is sometimes the sample has an impurity somewhere down in the substrate. So you can think of it as a, you know, a extra charge sitting down there. And that produces an electrical potential where the two dig is, which is gonna to wanna to trap an electrical charge. Um, so if you have a skirmion floating around uh, in the two dig, it's gonna get pinned on top of the impurity and just sit there as an object that you might try and actually image in the STM. So can they see it? Uh, it appears the answer is yes. So this is a 30 nanometer by 30 nanometer field of view. And at the very center, they know that there's a charge defect there producing this pinning potential. And then what they do is they just image the charge density in the graphene uh, at the nanoscale. So shown in two, these different blowups here is just a blow up of what does the charge density look like in regions one, two, three, and four. And you'll see in each of these regions, you see a sort of charge density wave, a tripling of the unit cell, but the detailed structure of the pattern is changing as you move around in space. Um, what this corresponds to actually is that each of these different types of patterns corresponds to being somewhere different on this block sphere of different valley uh, order parameters. Um, and you can work this out quantitatively. So at each, each of these regions, you can figure out where you are on the block sphere. So by doing this sort of analysis, looking at each patch, seeing the nature of the charge density wave there, you can actually read out from it the order parameter that we think there might be skirmions in. And then when you plot it, you actually see there's this whirling texture in the order parameter uh, consistent with there being a skirmion um, in one of the particular spin species. So we can compare experiment and theory. Uh, for the experiment, we can measure both the angle around the block sphere and the pointing towards the North and South Pole. And you get this particular uh, pattern here. And then we can do theory. We can look at a nonlinear sigma model and predict what would the pattern of polarization be if you indeed had a skirmion somewhere. And you find this pretty remarkable agreement between uh, the theory curve uh, and the experiment. Um, so the takeaway here is it appears that by using STM, we can measure at the lattice scale the presence of skirmions in this valley type order parameter. Uh, and because this valley type order parameter is also the one relevant to twisted bilayer graphene, uh, it should be possible to do similar experiments there to actually uh, detect the presence of skirmions in that model and then potentially uh, see whether that's what leads to superconductivity. Um, okay, so uh, in conclusion, uh, I've discussed a particular example of this very uh, attractive idea where the particles of a system could be topological defects. 
Uh, and in this case, we have the interesting uh, physics that if these skirmions occur in a system like twisted bilayer graphene, they carry charge two um, and could form bosons, which superconducts. Um, so I think this is a very interesting direction, both seeing whether this is really what's happening in twisted bilayer graphene or looking for other materials where uh, the same physics might be at play. So with that, I want to thank um, my collaborators. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thanks for the great talk. And again, I, I apologize for um, some noise uh, that somebody produced. I no have to learn how to how to mute everybody uh, as a host. Uh, yeah, great talk. So, uh, but but now I, I allow people to unmute. So, please, if, if there are any questions. Uh... Yes. Look at the raised hands. Can I can I go first? Uh, yeah, you, you first and then Steve. Okay. Um, so Mike, very nice stuff. Um, I wanted to ask a question because I don't know some of the relevant numbers here. So your theory involves um, description of uh, uh, charge two bosons made out of two skirmions or skirmion anti-skirmion. Yeah. Uh, which you described very nicely. But my question is, you know, this is, this is like a mechanism where you form charge two bosons um, and then they both condense. Now, of course, in many or most superconductors, what you have instead is the BCS sort of limit of weak pairing rather than strong pairing, right. where the size of a Cooper pair is much bigger than the spacing between the fermions. So my question is about how the size of these skirmions compares with the uh, distance between, between typical uh, electrons in the doped uh, bilayer graphene when it becomes superconducting? Is this the appropriate limit and how do these numbers work out? Yes, yeah, so that's a very interesting question. So there's actually two experiments who have looked at this, both from Pablo's group. One is in twisted bilayer graphene. There's also an analogous system, which is twisted trilayer graphene, which has the same band structure we'd require for this scenario. So we think the same could occur in each. So in twisted bilayer graphene, they measure the coherence length. They find a coherence length of about 50 nanometers, um, which corresponds to about five more A spacings. And of course, the relevant densities they're looking at is on the order of, say, a half electron per more A cell. Um, so that tells you that in twist and bilayer graphene, the coherence length is maybe a factor of three or four larger than the interparticle distance. So that one. I mean, it's maybe not weak coupling BCS, but it's not necessarily a regime where um, it's, it's like inverted, like you're saying. In twisted trilayer graphene, uh, unfortunately I don't have it, but they produce exactly the curve you're thinking of where they, they measure the coherence length versus the interparticle density. Um, there, the coherence length is even shorter. They find a coherence length of say 10 nanometers, um, which is basically the Moray spacing. Uh, and it's comparable to the interparticle distance over a range of dopings. So in the twisted trilayer graphene, they're really in a regime where the coherence length is comparable or even uh, smaller than the interparticle di distance. Okay, I was I was kind of asking about in terms of your theory calculations, though. How are the oh. how how would the size of a skirmion pair compare with? Oh yeah, um, yeah. So this yeah. Spacing? Yeah, the skirmion pair um, we we find is basically the Moray scale. Yeah. Um, like this is one of the pictures of them here. Each of these dots is like one Moray period, and you can see they end up having a size of two or three. Um, so if you're in a region of low doping relative to say nu is equal to two, you, you could certainly be in the regime where the interparticle spacing would be quite a bit lower than the the, the size of the skirmions, which is basically what the coherence length is. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, another thing which is seen in the experiments is that they there's a TC for the superconductor. And then these are STM experiments where they measure what's the single particle gap for tunneling into the superconductor. And they find that the single particle gap can be about 10 times larger than the superconducting TC which is a, another way of looking at the fact that there's this difference in scales between the pairing energy, which is what you'd see in the single particle tunneling versus the condensation energy, which is what would set TC. 
It's not 3.5 DC, you're saying the gap is not DC. Yeah, maybe not 10, but yeah, 3.5, is that right? Yeah. Uh, don't remember. Okay, uh, Steve, please. Uh, thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, I brought back uh, memories from uh, my youth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so in the uh, bilayer anti-ferromagnetic case, Mm -hmm. You had this nice argument for why the skirmion, anti-skirmion, if you boosted them, that the energy would go like velocity squared or momentum squared. Yeah. Um, so do I do I understand correctly the picture would be that the there can't be any Cherenkov radiation of spin waves because it's an anti-ferromagnet and has has a like a speed of light, you know, linear dispersion for this. I haven't thought of that. So, so now you're wondering, um, is there a mechanism that either would allow or prevent radiation as this thing is moving? Yeah, it would cause damping of this thing. Yeah. And oh. that probably, probably if there is a, like a speed of light for the yeah, there is so spin waves. Then, as long as you have quadratic dispersion, you can you go at low velocities. There's no damping, but uh -huh. that, that's worth thinking about. And, yeah, then, and then you could have spin wave exchange and stuff. To and maybe there that's another source of interaction. Let's. I've never thought to compare that because there there are some people who have done calculations of what's the spin wave velocity so that we know. And numerically, we've computed this mass so we could figure out what's the velocity scale where you'd expect a crossing. I've never compared it. That's yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. I mean, another thing I don't no so a very there's a very interesting set of experiments which find that in twisted bilayer graphene there's linear t resistivity all the way down to 10 millikelvin from about 10 millikelvin to 30 kelvin uh, which which is pretty striking actually and i don't think there's a, a a definite theory yet for for where that comes about um so it's interesting to think about like in these sort of models, you'd have coupling between these electrical charges if they came in the form of skirmions and these modes in the actual order parameter. What what are the predictions then for the temperature dependent of resistivity? Yeah, I mean you can't you can't shrink off radiate spin waves, but you could Raman scat you could scatter them from thermally excited ones could scatter off the electrons. It could be interesting. Okay. Um... Other questions? All right. Um, so it looks like uh, people are satisfied. I, I think because it's somewhat late and uh, I don't want to impose myself on everybody, uh, let's maybe thank uh, Mike again. Uh, it's a fantastic talk. I'll, I'll clap my hands, but you can show your <laughs> hands on screen. Uh, and again, thanks for coming, and uh, I really appreciate uh, you giving such a wonderful talk and covering uh, such a beautiful physics. Thank you, yeah. Mike. Thanks, Lena, and hope to see you in person soon. Yes, I hope so. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. It was very nice. Bye. Thank you.